<laughs> so look at somebody and say, you are made in the image of God. Male and female, he made you. That's a beautiful tr truth, isn't it? Can you believe that we're made in the image of God? So that every time you look at somebody, there's a part of God inside of them. And when you remember that, it's very hard to disrespect them, even when you disagree. Because there's a spark of life in them that is what I'm going to use a word. It's not in the Bible, but the principle of being sacred is in the Bible. We use the word holy, and we say every human life is sacred. Do you agree? That's why we believe that we're pro-life. That's why I believe that life begins at, in the womb and that we, we, we don't have the right to take that life. Now, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes because many of us might have lived in a way that was far from God and don't want to list all the things that we did that were far away from God. But now that we know him, we can repent and we can say, Lord, I need you as the compass of my life because I'm made in your image and I'm going to reflect your image in the earth. So the Lord led me to make a declaration of God dependence instead of a declaration of independence. So I'm just going to say it out loud to you what he's been putting on my heart, and you can decide if you want to bear witness. But I already read it. I quoted Genesis 1.27. God created us in his image, male and female, and he blesses our covenant commitments to him and each other. Okay? A covenant's not a contract. A covenant is what I said to my wife, till death do us part. We're going to stick this out. We're going to make it work. It's a covenant commitment. And Jesus made a blood covenant commitment to us. Yeah. We're in the middle of a bunch of culture wars. It's already been prayed about here. And I think we're going to have to give an account as to where we stood and if we remained silent during the midst of that. Okay? That's definitely true for me and Trisha because the Bible tells us that. In James, it says, be careful if you want to be a teacher because if you stand in the pulpit, you're going to be held to a higher level of accountability. So I don't have the right to just let the thing go by and not say anything. I've got to speak into it as a leader or I don't love you. I'm sorry. That's it. Tough love sometimes is what Jesus said to the woman who was caught in adultery. He said, I'm not condemning you, but go and sin no more. And when you talk to people, you've got to say that. And they could say, well, who are you to judge me? And, and I could say, I'm nobody to judge you. I'm just giving you good advice. Sinful lives lead to destruction. Last week we talked about the currency of the kingdom, that you and I are God's currency, and he chooses to spend us to redeem people's lives, first our own and then others. But the wages of sin is, is death, right? So that's leading to destruction. So if we're not sowing life, we're allowing the devil to sow destruction. And I don't want to get political. I don't think we have to. We just have to read our Bible to know where we stand on the issues right now. I'm not first white. I'm not first Italian. I'm not first American. I'm first a Christian. All right? That's where we all have to stand. We're covered under the blood of Jesus, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I would not even still be alive if it wasn't for the Lord. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. I was that stupid. I was making such stupid mistakes that I have to thank God every day that I'm even still alive. So why would I hold on to my old identity and forget that without Jesus, I'm not even here anymore. He's got to get the glory. I'm not going to deny him. Because then he said he would have to deny us. So that's first. I'm just going to keep saying that because it's the most important thing. But we're in this really toxic mix of a bunch of different perfect storms all lining up at the same time, right? So the election controversial, get it. Uh, the the COVID-19 thing is really rattling people from being in isolation and, and, and but like even major institutions are shifting things that haven't shifted in a really long time. And I'm not meaning to pick on anybody, but you know the Pope was quoted this week in a, in a statement that, on a, uh, a documentary film that he made, and he was in favor of civil unions for same-sex couples. Okay, now I mean that's 2,000 years, the first time that's ever happened. If that doesn't let you know that we're in a real like toxic brew of things shifting around and I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm just saying I cannot defend that in the Bible. I can't defend it. So we can't stand up here and say it's okay. And somebody could say, well, do you think you know more than the Pope? I'd say, no, I don't know anything. I just know how I read my Bible. 
And I'm willing to let anybody come and tell me how to defend that position. But I can't defend it. And, and that makes it tough, doesn't it? Because it makes it look like you don't love people. But tough love is always tough. We had Jack Frost come here many years ago, and because he loved a good friend of his that he knew was cheating on his wife, he snuck in the guy's house and waited in the garage. And then when that guy pulled in the garage at 3 o'clock in the morning, Jack Frost stepped out of the shadows and said, where were you? He says, I know where you were. You were with your mistress. Now, he could have got shot. Right? So you walk in somebody else's property and they don't know you're there. They could shoot you. But that's what tough love does. It takes a chance. It's because I love you that I, I feel compelled to have to tell you what the Word of God says. There might be different interpretations for different things, but I'm telling you, sexual sin is really black and white. You make a covenant commitment to somebody for life, and that's when God blesses it. Every other version of that is not not blessed by God. Amen. And I'm sorry, like, who wants to be this real, like, difficult person to deal with? I'm, I think that's what the world needs right now. They need a compass to point back to the truth. Yeah. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we really should shine right now in the darkness. Right? Patricia King, I think she even wrote a book called Light Belongs in the Darkness. So if it's getting dark around us, that shouldn't discourage us. God just said, this is going to give Jesus a, a better chance to make his case for why it's better to live as a Christian and, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Amen? Amen? So we have to take a stand for righteousness. We have to counter this unprecedented attack against traditional family values. That's what's happening right now. Your children, if they're going to public school, are being told that they can pick which gender they want to be. I mean, I've, I've been living here a long time. I never would have thought in my lifetime that would be an agreed-upon position in public schools. I don't want my tax dollars going for that. There's no scientific evidence of any of those things. We're made in his image, male and female. Why is this so difficult? Amen. Because if you can get people confused about their identity, you can control them. Amen. And we're not under anything, any other control but God. And that's why they came here, risked their lives. They started the country and said, this is going to be a free country. And, you know, free speech is not a fun thing because you have to, that means you have to let other people say things you don't want to hear. But when there's merit behind it, it'll last because there's bones and there's truth in it. And the truth is marching on, as Lisa sang in that song, Glory Hallelujah. So we should not be afraid to defend Christianity against any other worldview. 2,000 years, we've attracted the greatest minds to Christianity, and it's proven over and over again. If you want to fight it, that's fine. In fact, you probably should contend with the truth of the word to make sure you understand, I can believe this. I can set the course of my life around the truth of the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. So my, my declaration, my my. Things not working here because my communion spilled on my computer, so it got baptized in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Just the keyboard. That's okay. God gave me a workaround. So here's the question I want, I want you to ask yourself, and, and it should always be on the top focus of your mind. We have to say, who has the final authority over my life? God. Okay? God has final authority. The Word of God has to have final authority. Yeah. Not politicians, not the shifting and the sinking sands of our culture. It's the truth of the Word of God. It's marching on. Yeah. And even if there's a rebellion against it, and even if we go into a civil war, I'm not saying that we are, but even if we did, it doesn't change the truth of the Word. Right. And that's what we have to live by. That's my compass. The Holy Spirit is in me as as an assistant, as a helper, as a comforter, to say, if you go into persecution, and let's be honest, most of us have not. We have lived a really good life, but the sleeping church might be part of the cause of the problem in the culture. Yeah. We were telling, you know, here in Lance Wall now 15 years ago, saying the Christians need to rise up in the mountains, the seven mountains of the culture. We can't just hide in the church and say, come back and get us, Jesus, and get us out of here. No. Right? We, we're not here to evacuate, we're here to occupy, Jesus said, until I come back. And if we're not in the culture, we can't shift the culture. And you know, the Bible says judgment has to begin in the house of the Lord. 
So if there's problems in the culture, that means part of that is on us for not taking enough of a stand. All right, well, that sounds like it get political. I don't mean it to. It's the culture. That's what shapes the culture. Christians should be involved. Who's the, who's the, who's the, is that a senator? Scott from North Carolina or South Carolina? I mean, the guy's amazing. What a testimony he's had. He took a stand. The man who ended slavery in England, William Wilberforce, was talked out of going into the ministry by the guy that wrote Amazing Grace. <laughs> John Newton said, you're going to have more of an impact for the kingdom of God in Congress. Parliament would be their way of saying it. And that's the guy for 30 years. His singular purpose was to end slavery in England. And he did through the help of God. And not too long after that, slavery ended in America after the Civil War. It was Christians behind the, the end of that oppression. You can look at whatever version of history you want. That's just a fact. That's what happened. So I want to stick to the word right now. Missionaries aren't worried about the local culture when they get there because they know the word of God is so strong and so good that whatever sin and whatever spirits are operating in that area, God's spirit is greater. So we have to like plunge into the darkness sometimes and allow God to use us there when it would be safer to stay home. How about this one? I love this. Elijah in 1 Kings 18.21, he says, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. How many would say that? I believe the Lord is God, and I'm going to follow him. Doesn't mean I don't love people if I disagree with them. It's okay. That, that's allowed. You can disagree with people that you love, but you should always respect them. And we don't want to call them names. We don't want to be what we don't want to be. We don't want to be, if we don't like something in somebody else, why should we become the thing we don't like to try to win that that argument. You're not trying to win an argument. You're trying to tell people the truth. And you need Holy Spirit to help you know how to do that today. Because look, these problems are very complex. I'm in no way minimizing how difficult it is to try to solve them. But the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. So that's been the purpose of the enemy is just to try to get us divided and to lose our identity and even make it hard for people to go to church. Well, whose plan was that? God? The devil, of course. I'm not saying don't be careful and don't follow rules, but look, I, don't, I, I said it's like a perfect storm. You isolate people for months and months. Forsake not the assembly together with other believers. There's a reason that's in there. We need each other. We've got to hear each other. We've got to be in the corporate anointing. There's something about the prophetic words that flow when we're together that encourage people. It's not that it can't happen when you're on your own, but no one else is, is in that place with you at the time. You believe there's power in numbers, right? Yeah. If one puts 1,000 to flight, two put 10,000. How many are here right now? And you guys are hardcore. This is awesome. Yeah. You could have stayed home. You could have just watched it. No. You stepped out of the house and said, I'm not staying home. Oh, and that, you know, obviously I would love it when you come. But that's part of the choice you're making. And then similarly, Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we've already chosen. We're serving the Lord. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you today because I don't really, in, in some ways, it doesn't matter what happens in the culture. I'm staying laser focused on who God called me to be and what he called me to do. And if I get persecuted for that, that's going to be part of the deal. The Bible says that. You're not going to live a godly life without persecution. <laughs> and then in verse uh, 3 of Psalm chapter 11, a lot of you probably know this. I'm using the voice translation. It says, if the foundations are crumbling, is there hope for the righteous? Say yes. There is. Because God is still on the throne, okay? This is Psalm 11. You can look at it when, you're, uh, when you have time. In verse 2, it says, the wicked approach with their bows bent, and sneaking around in the shadows, they set their arrows against the bowstring and they're ready to fire that arrow. If the foundations are crumbling, is there hope for the righteous? The eternal has not moved. He's still on the throne. He remains in his holy temple. He sits squarely on his heavenly throne. That's the God we serve. Greater than any politician. How about this one? Hold up your Bible if you got it handy. 
Because we need to just make a decree about the Word of God. Even if it's on your phone, it's okay. Electric, electronic versions are legal here. <laughs> I'm reading from the Amplified, classic version. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13, as you hold that word up, the Word of God is living and active. You believe that? The thing you're holding in your hand has a heartbeat. It's alive. It, it's able to speak into situations that have never happened before because it's a dynamic book. It's alive with the power of the Spirit. The Word is alive, living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, this was in the Roman, the days of the Romans. They were the ones coming with the two-edged swords to take you by violence. This is sharper than the physical sword because... Oh, look at that. I, I started a video by mistake. Sorry. You'll have to wait for another t turn. <laughs> and what does it do? What does this word do? I better close the cover, then it won't start on me. That would be better. There you go. It cuts me, too. The word cuts me, too. It pierces me, it says, to the division of soul and spirit. Who's going to win? The word of God or the temptation that I'm facing? The word of God, the spirit, it pier the word pierces me. And I have, a, I have a feeling this is why a lot of people don't read the Bible enough, because it's very convicting. <laughs> because if I read it, that means I have to do it, because <laughs> it's true. And it's just easier to hold the grudge sometimes, isn't it? And, and it'll help me discern the thoughts and intentions of my heart, and, and it'll help other people do the same thing. But this is the part that really hit me. It says, no creature is hidden from the sight of the word of God, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? We're going to have to give an account someday. And look, you know, let's just be honest. If we were in a tough situation, like let's say we were in Germany, during World War II, or let's say we were in one of the countries that got occupied by Germany during World War II. I'm not meaning to offend any Germans here. I'm just saying, like, when you're in the middle of that battle, are you going to be Schindler, or are you going to be one of the people that looks the other way? It's hard to be Schindler, isn't it? It's hard to risk everything to protect somebody else. But God has called us to be courageous people. We don't, we don't shrink from the battle. But don't be foolish either, right? So that's where you got to just hear from the Lord. you got to know that it, there's an assignment. It doesn't hurt to talk to counselors either. You should be around mature Christian people that you could say, wow, I really have this burden. I've been praying and I just can't lose this thought. I feel like the Lord wants me to run for politics, let's just say. Well, that might be the Lord, right? It wouldn't be the devil. The devil doesn't want you there. But you want other people to confirm that and pray into it with you and give you verses so that when the time gets tough a year from now, you're like, no, I know the Lord told me to do this, and he confirmed it to me multiple times. And me and Trish have done that for 21 years that we've been here. There have been tough times for the church, but we both knew for sure this was the calling on our lives, and we could draw strength from each other because of that. I have to give an account to him. I can't just stand by and watch and I knew when I took the job that that was going to be true, right? It says it right in James. I think it's chapter 3, verse 1. Be not many masters is how it says it in the King James. Be careful if you're going to be a teacher. Because if you stand in the pulpit and you misdirect the flock, if you give them the wrong interpretation of what my word says, I'm going to hold you to a higher accountability. Now, that's not to scare anybody off and say don't do it. It's just you better have a fear of the Lord when you do it. How's that, Okay. Peter, 1 Peter 5 8, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's like a lion, but he's not a lion. He's a liar. He's a roaring liar. Proverbs 9 10 says, The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The chief and choice part of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So if I know the word and I feel myself drifting into a different GPS, I better go redirecting, redirecting. I better tune into the different satellite because there's a whole other GPS now that will pull you into sin in a New York minute, if you remember what that is. So you've got to stay, right, what, what do they call it? The plan that you get on your plan, unlimited data between you and heaven. 
You need an unlimited data plan. <laughs> I talked about the word sacred. The word of God is sacred. Marriage is sacred. Okay? The birth of a child is sacred. They're made in the image of God. We have to hold on to the sacred things in our culture. Salvation is sacred. What greater miracle could happen than you get saved? Right? But the world will try to normalize sin and say, no, sacred doesn't exist. That's just your opinion. You need to recognize the rules of engagement here. Say, that's not okay. That's not what the country was founded for. Okay, now, it's for the people and by the people, but if the people get misled, that means the church didn't do its job of leading. So maybe this message is for me. Okay, thanks. I got one guy out there who would agree. When God spoke to Moses, he said, you need to take your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. Right? There is a holiness that's required to live this life. We can't be flipping about it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when we start to mess in the culture with things that are rock solid in the word that are not debatable, sexual sin is one of those not debatable. Murder is not one of those not debatable. All right. He said, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's 1 Peter 1.16. I'm winding up here. Ephesians chapter 2. And part of this is my testimony. And it's in the voice. It says, we've all had our fill of indulging our flesh or indulging our flesh and mind. I obeyed the impulses and followed my perverse thoughts because I was motivated by dark powers. See, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. But we're the church. And once you get saved, the light shifts on the inside of you. And now you're carrying a different light. But I was indulging my flesh when I was a heathen. But God, right? That's right in there. Ephesians 2, verse 3. Uh, this, this is verse 4. But God saw Peter Roselli and didn't give up on him. Even though he could have pulled out a long list of, of violations. He said, no, you're the only one who suffers more when you don't repent. But once you repent, I forgive you. And now, what the devil meant for evil, I'm going to turn around for good. You used to play rock and roll music, now you're going to play worship music. <laughs> My mother used to say, her brother would tell him, when you're praying for your heathen son, picture him in church with his hands up. And at the time, I was a bouncer in a bar on the strip in Fort Lauderdale. So that was probably as far away or one of the furthest places you could get from church. And she said, okay, I'll pray for him that way. And then she would see me leading worship in church and go, wow, I just prayed that you'd have your hands up. Now you're leading worship. Because God does exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. <laughs> so it says, but God saw Peter, his unfathomable richness and his love and mercy focused on Peter, the guy who easily should have been dead for the stupidity of his life. And he united me, he, I'm sorry, he united me with the anointed one. Jesus, and infused my soul with his spirit, even though I was buried under a mountain of sin. This is the voice version. Man, is that a good picture. He raised me up with him, and he seated me in heavenly places with him. The liberating king. His desire was to create in his body one new version of humanity. It says in Ephesians 2.15. A new version of humanity that will fuse with the old part. He doesn't want you to forget the old part because that gives you an authority to help other people who are dealing with that problem. So Joyce Meyer, because she came out of horrific sexual abuse, has authority through the word but also through her own freedom because she didn't just read in a book that God can set you free. She got set free. I got set free from drug addiction and alcoholism and sexual perversion. So I have an authority in the spirit if I choose to step into it. It doesn't mean the more sin, the more authority you have. No, but it, it is a true thing that when you've experienced something, you know it firsthand. And you will go fight for that person because you know exactly what that poverty of that sin was like. What a good news message we have. There's nobody too far away from God. No matter what thing you're dealing with, he has the answer for it.
But we are supposed to be the ambassadors who are the conduit for him to work through. And if we hide in our cave, we're not doing our job. And, you know, I say that as a biblical example. Who did that? Who was hiding in the cave? Yeah, he, was, he thought he was the only one left. I break that off of you right now. You're not the only one left. We all have the power of the ecclesia working together. There's a whole lot more praying Christians than you would think in America right now. And, and whether it's for the election or not, look, there's a bigger thing than the election. Believe it or not, even though the press would make you think that's the biggest thing. The bigger thing is not normalizing sin. All right? Can I say it that way? We want, to, we want to show the world that the Word of God is showing the best model for life of how to flourish. And if you start getting caught up into debates, well, is this person going to hell? Is that person going to hell? What about that sin? That's just a distraction. All right? I just know this. If I'm obedient, I get blessed. If I'm, if I'm disobedient, a curse is on my life. That's just the truth of the Word. The curse is broken by the blood of the lamb, but if I open the door back up again, guess what? I can let it back in. I'm not letting it back in, at least not knowingly. <laughs> so, I got more, but I'm just going to end here. Thank you, Nate. You're, such, you're so good for my self-esteem. I should say my God-esteem. not supposed to have too much self-esteem. <laughs> I think it'd be good if we stand. I don't pay him to say that, by the way, just so you know. I've been tempted. She was wondering, she said. All right, if you follow our church, you know that we're covered by Chuck Pierce and Gloria of Zion, and we do a lot with him, and Trish has been all over the world on ministry trips with him. Uh, you know, we took me a while in our couple, it took me a while to understand the way he preached and, and his teachings. And You know, every, every person is fallible, but he really does know how to hear from God. And, and I love, you know, what he has taught me in my life. And, you know, it's, it's to be prophetic, but it's also that we're living right now in the decade of the decree. Based on the Hebrew calendar, 5780 was last year, started the decade of the decree. And then this is Aleph Pei, 5781, so we're decreeing, but, but that one has, has like a leadership quality to it, like a father-like quality to it. So wouldn't it be a little ironic that in the decade of the decree, we have to wear a mask? If that's not a prophetic statement, what is? The devil's stealing people's voices by affecting their lungs. We have to minister in the opposite spirit. You're out here standing out here. You can use your voice. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's so good. We've been without it so long, we forgot what it's like. Amen. I mean, you might be doing it in your home. That's cool. But it's better to do it together. The Bible says, let us exalt his name together. We're going to magnify the Lord when we do it together. So that's why I would like you just to repeat this part after me, okay? For his divine power has bestowed on me absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness. All right, this is Second Peter chapter 1. His divine power came into my life, and now he's given me everything I need for this life that he wants me to live, a dynamic spiritual life so that I can only be godly through him working in me. But the power's there for everything I need. Man, isn't that good news? Just because I haven't found it yet or figured out which part of the power is going to help, again, what Chuck has helped me understand is that I can live a prophetic lifestyle and I can get downloads along the way. Sometimes he wants you to write it down. Other times he wants you to just say, you open your mouth and I'll fill it not wrong to write things down, but other times he's saying, how much do you trust me? If you really trust me, I'll fill your mouth when you open it. Test me and see if I'll do that. And he does. All right. So it's going to say, I'm just going to read this part. It says, for by these 
gifts that he's given us, these powers, the, this, the power that he's bestowed on us, it's part of his nature that's living right on the inside of us. Precious, magnificent promises so that by them you can escape the corruption of the world. So can we say this decree out loud? The power of God is living inside of me and allows me to escape all the corruption of the world. I'm not missing any of the necessary tools, but I have to tap in to the power of God to the exclusion of my flesh. Mm. All right, last one. And then I'm just going to say a blanket prayer for everybody that's here. Can you lift your hand? It's just, this is like a declaration. I am a partaker of the divine nature of God. Now look at somebody and say it to them. You are a partaker of the divine nature of God. And you have everything you need to live a godly life, to prosper in the kingdom, and to be an ambassador for the king. In Jesus' name, you are all deputized as ambassadors for the king. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I don't have to sleep on the couch tonight. <laughs> I love you all. I just want to pray for anybody that's here. If you don't know the Lord, because I know there's some people that are visiting, just hold on for a minute, okay? Can you hold on for one minute? Remember I said salvation could be listed as one of the greatest miracles that any of us could ever experience. How many would agree with that? Right? Your whole life changes. When you get saved, when you receive the Lord as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and empowers you in ways that you couldn't do in the natural. So just on the idea that there might be somebody visiting here that doesn't know the Lord. Wouldn't it be a good thing that today would be their spiritual birthday? October 25th, 2020, my whole life changed because I said a prayer. I invited the Lord in and boy, did he meet me. How many would say that when you asked him in, everything changed for the better. So I'm not going to embarrass anybody if you feel like we're putting you on the spot, we're not. We're just saying, say this prayer with us, okay? Church, can you say it out loud? Yes. Now look, you're recognizing, if it's you, you're recognizing you've been looking for something that's been missing, and we're going to hear, we're telling you that it's Jesus. It's Father God and the Holy Spirit that you've been missing, and that we'll all tell you, you can trust Him with the reins and the steering wheel of your life. You can put your trust in Him. Not the easiest thing to make changes, but he'll help you. So when you make this prayer, be sincere. And we'll just say it this way. Say it out loud. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I recognize there's sin in my life. That I need to be saved from that sin. I'm powerless to stop on my own. But I can't save myself. I heard today that you can save me from that life of sin. I invite you now to come into my life to help me, Lord. Save me and forgive me for all the ways I offended you. I receive adoption into your family because of the sacrifice of Jesus and his resurrection from the tomb. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior and your Holy Spirit in me to empower me to serve you for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Now, I hope somebody here said that, but it might be somebody on the camera that's watching. I don't have to know the answer. I just need to do what God is telling me to do. But here's the deal. If you said yes and you invited Jesus in, here's the promise. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead excuse me, is now alive and living in you. So whatever dead thing you think is never going to resurrect, that's reversed now in Jesus' name. And you've got resurrection power in your life. 
So we rejoice with you if you said that prayer, but we rejoice with all of you as well as you go in power this week and you reflect the glory of God in the way you live as ambassadors for the kingdom. Have an awesome day. We love you.